third session is about uh, applying terrestrial uh, mining concepts to asteroid projects. The speaker is Mark Saunter. Mark is the Director of Mining and Processing for Deep Space Industries. Uh, he previously founded Asteroid Enterprises in 1986 after giving an asteroid resource recovery talk uh, at a space engineering conference down under. Um, and he uh, founded his uh, day job company, Radiation Advice and Solutions, uh, in 1995. Mark is a miner and well-known consultant to mining uh, companies across the globe, as well as an asteroid expert whose paper, The Technical and Economic Feasibility of Mining Near-Earth Asteroids, is often cited in peer review papers. So, uh, so we can all welcome uh, Mark Sonny. Thank you very much, everybody. Um, I guess I really want to explain, I'm not a mining engineer, I'm a physicist, but I've worked in the Australian uh, mining industry since 1976. I've been involved with uh, open pit, underground and in situ leach mining operations. I've become uh, sort of an accidental mining engineer by osmosis and an accidental metallurgist by osmosis. Uh, and in this talk I want to try and, I'm not talking about the details. Uh, uh, that we're thinking of for asteroid mining, but I'm seeking to draw parallels, compare and contrast uh, with, with the terrestrial mining situation. Well, we all know that near-Earth asteroids offer both promise and threat. Uh, and for today's audience, I'm assuming everybody understands that, uh, that the NEAs contain resources that will be immense uh, use for future space development, and it's a given that the technologies to access those resources will also enable humanity to deflect at least some of the impact threat objects. But I want to bring to your awareness uh, uh, certain mining concepts, uh, ideas of project development pathways that apply on the Earth, and how we uh, value, how we um, assess both uh, resources and actual um, uh, proposed mining projects. The sort of concepts I want to bring to your mind are, are, are the ideas of what is mineralisation, what is a mineral resource, what is an ore reserve. I want to um, talk about the definition of ore, uh, talk about uh, ore body concepts, the idea of ore grade and contained value project concept development uh, pathways, how uh, a mining company will seek to plan out, uh, scope out, uh, identify its, its mining project from the start. Uh, how are we going to develop this mine? Uh, what are the processes that we're going to use in our beneficiation and our metallurgical treatment plant? Ideas of uh, project development through an order of magnitude study, through a, a pre-feasibility study and then a bankable feasibility study ideas of project valuation, ideas of capital expenditure, capex, operational expenditure, opex, payback period and net present value, all are crucial in how mining companies assess their potential future products. And, and, and we have to bring these same sorts of ideas to space mining ventures and in, in my particular circumstance I'm trying to apply them to asteroid mining ventures. It's not obvious, it's not easy to, to determine the different mission options and choose between them. And we have to use some, some mental tools to do that. So that's what this talk's all about. The resources of near-Earth space, I'm using that, that as, a, 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 as a specific reference to John S. Lewis's book of the same title. The resources of near-Earth space range through sunlight, raw regolith gravel, reduced nickel-iron metal, magnetite, uh, oxidised metal, water, gases, all the volatiles, kerogen, which is a sort of an asphalt-like material, the complex hydrocarbons in the carbonaceous chondrites, platinum group metals and silicon. We have a, a significant range of different possible products that we might want to choose between. 
in our asteroid mining ventures. We have a large number of potential targets, and Chris Lewecki was talking about them, and uh, uh, the, the, the number of potential targets is getting bigger all the time. And uh, the number of potentially hazardous asteroids, uh, now about 1,300, the number of near-Earth asteroids that are known, now about 9,800, soon to top uh, 10,000. Specifically, the PHAs uh, represent not only the hazardous objects, but, but a subset uh, of them represent the, the, the most accessible asteroids and probably the ideal mining targets. Asteroid structure and composition, uh, the pictures that we have so far all show that asteroids retain regolith. It's hard to think back even as, even as we've gone and disappeared, haven't we? Okay. I was going to say it's hard, it's hard to think back even to uh, 90, 90, 951 Gasper in, in uh, 1991, 1993, whenever it was when the Galileo probe flew past it, how, how surprised the astronomers were to see regolith on such a small body. And of course, even Itakawa, which is only 500 metres long, shows regolith, uh, gravel-sized regolith in the seas, large boulders in the higher areas. Um, the pictures that we have so far show heavily fractured or rubble piles. Um, the, Stephen, it's gone again now. Uh, we have indications of significant porosity uh, from, um, from meteorite uh, data, ground truth from meteorites. We have, we have knowledge that many of these things have water in clays or in salts. Uh, many of these objects uh, have magnetite in them. So we've got this, this plethora of of uh, potentially usable material. The value of these commodities in space is thousands of dollars per kilogram because uh, the, 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 the value is competing against launch cost. So any of these materials that can be separated out and delivered to low Earth orbit or to, or to geostationary orbit or to other places, other locations in Earth orbit for use in Earth orbit, uh, they're competing against uh, Earth launch costs. So the, 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 the present Earth launch costs ranges from $10,000 upwards in, in low Earth orbit, $40,000 or so in, in geo. Uh, the prices will come down, but those are the sorts of potential values. Even if they come down substantially, thousands of dollars per kilogram is the value of the, the sorts of materials that might be extracted out of these objects returned to Earth orbit for use in Earth orbit. So assess, ass, ac, assessing, that should be accessing, I'm sorry, accessing asteroid resources is dependent on the development of markets for mass in orbit. We need to learn how to compare schemes for mining a near-Earth asteroid and returning the product to market. I mentioned earlier CapEx, payback time, net present value. These actually end up being mission, mission drivers. They, they, are, they are drivers to how you design your asteroid resources project. They help us decide in our choice of target, market, product, mission type, and by that I mean tra trajectory out and back, extraction process and propulsion system. It's going to be economic, it's going to be economic terms like payback time and, and capex and opex. It's going to be economic terms that will help us to, to decide between different alternative projects. What is ore? Here we go. Mining Engineering 101 says that a material is ore if you can mine, process, extract, and take it to market and sell it and make a profit. If you can't make a profit out of mining some material, it's not ore. And uh, here we go, Steve. I'll keep talking. You can play. Uh, development of a mine project, mine project planning involves choosing between different competing mining and metallurgical extraction concepts so as to minimise your capex, minimise your operating costs and your payback time and minimise your project risk and maximise the chances of making a profit. And the choices you make 
in your mining and in your processing affect your definition of an ore? Or is economic mineralisation? I thought I'd put in some pretty pictures because I've been showing you text until now. Here's a picture of a, of a 250-ton haul truck, a Cat 9, a 79, 798 or something like that, uh, at a large copper, open pit copper mine in central South Australia, one of my clients. The material that they're digging there is worth, as it's loaded into the truck, about $170, $180 per tonne. Uh, what is ore? Here is a, a picture of another one of my clients, Ranger Uranium Mine in the Northern Territory. They mine uh, a quarter of a percent uh, uranium content in the rock. Again, you've got 250-tonne haul trucks uh, hauling material out of the open pit. And uh, once it's processed, you get the uranium out, and there it is sitting in the drums at something like 95% U308 in the drums. 20,000 bucks per drum. The value of asteroid regolith, well, a typical near-Earth asteroid might, might contain 50 parts per million platinum group metals. It might contain 10% nickel iron metal or 10% oxidised metal as magnetite, and it might contain 10% water. A carbonaceous asteroid might easily contain 20% water. That material extracted and provided for use in space might be worth something upwards of a million dollars per tonne. That's what its value would be in orbit, potentially, based on launch costs, near future launch costs. A million dollars a tonne is very high value ore. I just showed you pictures of, of ore worth $200-odd a tonne, $170 a tonne, uh, $250 a tonne. We're talking about a million dollars a tonne. A million dollars a tonne is very, 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 very valuable ore. So that's the, that's the value proposition. Chris Lewicki talked about the synodic period, and I think, I think David Gump did earlier on, that the, 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 the fact that our, our access is only intermittent to these objects. This synodic period uh, constraint, this intermittent access only situation, means that asteroid resource missions will be similar to short campaign mining of remote, very high value ore bodies. It's not the same as continuous operation of low value ore bodies on Earth. We are, the, 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 the terrestrial comparisons that are the better comparisons are the comparisons with short campaign mining of remote, very high value ore bodies. We've got to get our mind thinking not about big, big open pits and big trucks moving low value material, but small niche operations moving very high value material and only intermittently. Examples that come to my mind are the Klondike Gold Rush in 1898. 100,000 people tramped into the Klondike. Only a few of them made money, but they made lots of money. 1920s radium mines. Radium in 1911 was worth $200,000 a gram. Can you believe that? $200,000 a gram. It gradually dropped in price to $50,000 a gram over the next 30 years. The, you know, the, the, that, that's, that's remote, high-value operations. The, 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 the two mines in the world that supplied radium, most of it, were Shinkalobe in the Belgian Congo and uh, Port Radium on Great Slave Lake in the Northwest Territories. So they were both very, very, very remote, life-threatening dangerous locations. The 1930s airlift supported gold dredging in Bololo, New Guinea. I'm, a, I'm a, an Australian and a New Guinean, and uh, uh, there's fascinating stories of, of, of uh, uh, three townships, uh, uh, about eight 2,000 tonne dredges, uh, all supported totally by airlift. There were no roads into this remote highlands location in New Guinea. Totally supported by airlift through the entire 1930s. The Akati diamond mine in Canada is, it only has 
access for 10 weeks a year via ice roads. The Namibia offshore diamond dredging is again in a very, very remote sort of location. Deep sea black smoke and massive sulphide mining is just starting up. Um, mining uh, black smoker chimneys on the top of sea mounts at one and a half kilometres depth in, in, in the deep ocean. What, what, what supports that? The fact is that it's 50% metal that they're mining. 50% metal. You don't have to pick up very much to make your money. Artisanal or, or illegal sometimes gold mines in Brazil and India are the other sorts of things that, that, uh, that are remote, uh, very high value operations. In the asteroid circumstance, we have to get our ore body concept right, just as, the, as we do, to, do in the terrestrial circumstances. I've come across cases in the terrestrial circumstances where the ore body concept was not properly understood. And as a result, the mine failed to recover something like 50% of the value that it could have recovered. Some mines have failed totally because the, 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 the management had a cor a, an incorrect or an incomplete concept of the ore body. In our case with, with asteroids, uh, what's our ore body concept? Is it a regolith draped rubble pile? Is it a reaccreted gravel pile? Is it a cryptocometry body or is it a monolith? If we choose wrong, we could have a project totally fail. Okay? Well, I've just said all that, so I'll, I'll move on to the next slide. Uh, as a General Atomics Beverly Uranium Institute leach project in South Australia lost in excess of 30% of its contained value because they didn't understand their ore body. Here's a picture, a cartoon, of a regolith draped rubble pile. We might want to try to extract surface regolith, or we might want to try and probe for the subsurface to see if there's ices in those void spaces. Cryptocometry asteroids is another different, quite different ore body concept uh, where we have highly porous bodies with uh, something like 30, 30 to 50 percent more uh, of the mass is water, very low density, very low strength, a different sort of mining approach would be required. Cryptocometry model uh, might have a, a surface fluffy layer and then a, a, a subsurface densified icy layer and then underneath that uh, a, a deep porous low density ice clay kerogen matrix. That's one particular model of a comet. I think it's the Prialnek and Brin model or something like that. And David Brin is the, the guy who later became the, the famous science fiction writer. Mineral resources and ore reserves, I want to talk through briefly. Uh, the, in, in the terrestrial mining circumstance, uh, 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 a mineralisation gets discovered and a mining company wants to raise money on the stock exchange on the basis of its discovery. It goes out to the stock exchange and it, it, it's, it's required to sign off. It, it, one of its professionals or, or, or a, a consultant hired by the company has to put his name to a legal document, which is, which is a, 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 a mineral resources certification. And it might, might be at various different levels. The mineral resources might be inferred, indicated or measured. And each of those is increasingly uh, more sure, more clearly defined level. So mineral resources are what you think is there based on sampling, cutoff grade and statistics. If you want to move forward into mining, you've got to have something a little bit more certain. Again, you've got to, you've got to know precisely, I, I have either proven or probable or reserves. And all reserves are the material that you know you can mine and you know you can process and you know you can sell. And we're nowhere near either inferred, indicated or measured resources in terms of asteroids. We're way up, some, somewhere up above the inferred. There's an even vaguer, there's an even less clear category called conceptual target amount or conceptual target quantity or conceptual target contained metal, something like that. We, we need to keep reminding ourselves of how little we know about these bodies. We know that they've got a lot of prospective material in them. We know that they represent potentially a lot of value, but we don't know much about uh, quantitatively what we've got in them. Uh, uh, 
we, we've no, there's no clarity at all yet, and that's why we need these, these, these early prospector missions. So mineralisation, resources and reserves uh, for classification and reporting to stock exchanges. Companies around the world will either use the Australasian JORC, Joint or Resis Resources Committee uh, Code, or the Canadian National Instrument 43101. A professional has to sign off his professional opinion on the, on the tonnes and grade uh, in, in the mineralisation uh, and, 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 uh, and assert to, the, to his belief that it's notionally mineable. The ore body may be defined by its geometry or by a notional cut-off grade. Where did this ore come from? It, it came from, from uh, cases back in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the 60s in Australia. In the 1969 era, there was a nickel boom in Australia and there were some uh, shady characters who, raided, who, who raised money on the stock exchange by, uh, by, by um, selectively quoting uh, sample um, uh, sample assays from, from drilling without quoting the entire story. Uh, those shady characters had to be somehow sidelined out of the industry and the Australasian Jork Code was produced uh, to sort of shunt them out of the industry. In, in Canada, there was the Briex scandal and Briex was, was a gold deposit, supposedly, in Indonesia. And Briex, uh, as a company, ramped right up to enormous valuations because it was purportedly a huge uh, gold prospect in Indonesia, but it turned out that the samples had been salted, i.e. gold had been, you know, scurrilously placed in the samples before they were assayed. So in Australia in 1969, there was the nickel boom scandal, and in Canada in, in the um, uh, probably mid-90s, there was the Briex scandal, and, and those two scandals forced this, this, this uh, uh, certification process, which is now worldwide. There are different types of ore bodies, and uh, what we look to in asteroids is yet another different type of ore body, of course. But let me, let me point out to you the differences in, in terrestrial ore bodies. Gold, uranium and base metals, nickel, cobalt, nickel, copper, lead, zinc, tend to be constrained in volume, ore bodies which are, which are isolated and, 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 and uh, very, very geometrically defined, defined by forts or by uh, 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 what's the word? metasomatic uh, movement of, 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 of uh, liquors from, from igneous activity, giving you very, very distinct ore bodies, possibly with halos, possibly very uh, clearly cut off, but, but they're small, they're small. They tend to be, you know, a half a kilometre by a kilometre or half a kilometre by half a kilometre or, or small constrained ore bodies. Rich, high grade perhaps, but constrained. Constrained both by total volume and by grade. There's another entire type of ore bodies which tend to be very, very extensive. Coal, iron ore and bauxite. Uh, you just think about it, a coal ore body. I grew up... Uh, 50 miles south of, of Sydney in a place called Wollongong, which was on the coast south of Sydney. Coal mining uh, was, the, was the big industry there, still is the big industry. The, the, the Sydney Basin is a coal mining uh, basin that, that runs from uh, about 50 miles south of where I live to about 150 miles north of Sydney and about 300 miles inland from Sydney. The coal basin, the Sydney, the Sydney Basin, is this very extensive series of coal seams that st stretches over, as I say, this, this sort of big dish plate uh, that's, that's about 200 miles in radius, for God's sake. Um, and it contains more uh, hydrocarbons than all of Saudi Arabia and all of Iran. And, and you know, it, it's like the, the, the Pennsylvania and, and, and Appalachian coal mines here in the US or the Permian Basin oil fields in West Texas, New Mexico. So things like coal and iron ore and bauxite tend to be very extensive. And in those cases, the ore body is not constrained by volume at all. It's constrained by, by things like seam thickness, the extent of waste, penalty metals, and so on. Now, NEAs, asteroids, I 
would say, are much more like B in as much as most, most of the near-Earth asteroids will contain, can be, can be, can be confidently claimed to contain either uh, volatiles or metals or both in amounts that are potentially easily retrievable. We're not looking for small, isolated, uh, uh, concentrated uh, bodies. We're, we're looking for bodies that are going to have value broadly spread, widely spread, widely distributed throughout all, or most of them. So for a long time I focused on gold, uranium, base metals type of war bodies, and then I realised only a little recently that, that no, in, in the asteroid circumstance, one of the things that we have going for us is that most asteroids will contain valuable material. Not only a few of them, but most. This is something that, that I think is not clear to most people. So mineral resource estimates in an expanding in-space market, virtually all retrieved mass from these asteroids will have value. You can get out the volatiles, you can get out the metal. Uh, the fact that most of the mass that you recover is valuable reduces this problem that I talked about of, of how do I define the value? How do I comply with this, this professional requirement of, of, of putting a valuation on the resource when the, when, when the value is only a small fraction of the total mass? We don't have that problem. The value is, resides in, in, in most, most of the mass that's returned, even the regular that we return can be sold for, for radiation shielding. Now, let me go on to valuation of mineral projects. How's my time going, Steve? OK. Let me go on to the valuation of mineral projects. Um, at the very start of an exploration company's activities, it will be involved in, in, in um, uh, desktop studies, trying to zero in on a target, uh, trying to decide where it's going to go look. And um, so grassroots or greenfield exploration is the start. Uh, and then, say they find mineralisation, then they'll move forward into a, a, into a further project stage where they go into advanced exploration, and that a advanced exploration tends, is intended to drill out the ore body, get more information, and get to the point where you can quantify the mineral, what did I say, mineral resource. So that at that stage, they, they write their first specifications, their first reports to the stock exchange saying, we believe we've, we've found a jork compliant resource of um, so many million tonnes of ore containing so many thousand tonnes of uranium, whatever it happens to be. Then you move forward. The, the board of directors will say, we've got a project. We've got a project here. Now we've got to find out how we're going to mine it and how we're going to process it. So they move into the pre-development project planning, which I'll expand on in a later slide. Then they move forward finally, if that, if that passes muster, if that gets a big tick, then you'll move forward, the board will say, okay, we're going to go and develop a mine. And finally, you've got the operational mine. That's the sort of, and at each of these stages, there are different ways of valuing the project. And the valuation is initially very small. And the valuation grows as you retire the different risks. And once you've got an operational mine, all the risks have been retired apart from possibly uh, the ongoing market risk of, of, of prices going up and down. So the valuation of the project rises as the risks get retired. Project valuation might be, at the very early stages, simply a multiple of the, of the, of the, of the expenditure that you've... the money that you've spent on, on drilling, for example. Or it might be based on, on your, your contractual joint venture terms or your farming terms with, with, your, with, your, with your partners that have come in. You might be a small exploration company, you found something, you, you uh, enter into a contract with a large mining company to uh, have them support you and in return they get equity. So that, that might be a basis of valuation. There is a, a, a Canadian geoscience Kilburn rating which, which, which ranks projects in terms of a whole bunch of tick, tick the box on a matrix location, uh, access to... Uh, uh, utilities, um, probable ore grade, uh, probable uh, ore body size, etc., etc. There are resource rules of thumb. For example, you've got a gold prospect, you think you've got so much uh, uh, inferred mineral r resource uh, and it'll be quoted in terms of dollars per ounce of gold in the ground. 
Moving forward into a more risk-retired situation, a developing project situation, the project might be valued on the basis of risk-weighted expected value. And finally, uh, you, you move into a situation where you base the valuation of the project on the expected net present value. I'm, I'm saying all this because the same things are going to apply in space mining. So examples of, 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 of valuation, gold projects, as I said, dollars per ounce of resources or dollars per annual ounces of production, coal projects, dollars per annual tonnes production, oil and gas, dollars per attributable contained barrels of oil equivalent, base metals, capitalisation of cash flow or dollars per pound of in-ground metal. We've got so many dollars per pound of contained copper or pound of contained zinc or whatever it happens to be, pound of contained uranium. Now, that's valuation. How do these things get, get developed in the real world? This is a, a picture of a mine project development pathway. You start, as I said, with desktop studies. The, the, the board of directors says, we want to go look for copper in the Zambian copper belt, gold in the Nevada Kalan trend, uh, coal in Indonesia, uh, uranium in um, Saskatchewan, whatever it happens to be. They decide a general um, uh, region where they want to look for something. And then they'll go to the open literature data reviews. They'll go to um, data in the university libraries. They'll go to open book data in, in geological survey uh, organisations. And they'll scour through the literature to find what's been looked for where in the past. They'll finally decide after going through their literature surveys, OK, these particular target areas within these regions that we chose, these are the target areas we're going to send our geologists out to. Send out the guy with the Toyota and the, uh, and the, and the pickaxe and, and, the, uh, and the handheld X-ray spectrometer. Nowadays, you know, they don't just stop with pickaxes. They've got these little ray guns. Zap the, zap the rock and see what copper and zinc and lead is in it. So you, you then go on to this reconnaissance of field targets and you find a field target. You might do reconnaissance by aerial radiometrics or aerial gravity or, or, or something like that and find targets not by having feet on the ground but by flying over and identifying geophysical targets. That's going to be more like our situation. The field work identifies extended mineralisation and you go in and then you start uh, investigating the prospect more deeply to define its ore body. Classically, this is done by drilling. In our situation, with asteroid mining, I don't think we'll be doing drilling. We'll be doing some other definition of ore body. You find your ore body, you've, you've defined the ore body, you've, you've, uh, you've got your initial JORC or NI43101 compliance statement out. You reckon you, you, you know you've got so many tonnes of contained uranium or so many ounces of contained gold or whatever. You've got to have metallurgical test work to confirm you can actually get the, sh get the stuff out. You've got to get the stuff out. <laughs> you, might have, you might have gold that's trapped there that you can't get out. You might have refractory ore that simply refuses to be treated. So there's got to be metallurgical test work. The, then, then you move forward into a project concept plan. Are we going to mine this by open pit or by underground or by in situ leach? Are we going to process it by acid leach or by solvent extraction or by alkaline leach or by smelting or what? <clears throat> there are a bunch of different choices to be made and all that gets fleshed out in the project concept planning, the order of magnitude study, sometimes so-called, and then moving forward, if that, if that still shows no showstoppers, moving forward into a pre-feasibility study. The pre-feasibility study will zero in generally on the preferred mining method, the preferred processing method, and it will give you for the first time, something in the way of costs. Costs plus or minus 30%. That's what a pre-feasibility study has to do. Has to give you capital and operating costs to plus or minus 30%. The board of directors looks at that and says, well, you know, it looks as though it's a goer, and, and presses the, the go button on a bankable feasibility study and an environmental impact statement. The bankable feasibility study's task people working the bank or feasibility, so they have to get costs down to preferably plus or minus 10% in terms of capital and in terms of operating. 
I've got and EIS, environmental impact study, in brackets. But the bankable feasibility study and the environmental impact study have to go hand in hand. Just say the environmental impact study identifies some uncontrolled risk. What are you going to do? You've got to control that risk. What's that going to do? That's going to cost money. That cost has to be fed back into the BFS. So the EIS and the BFS are hand in glove. They are conjoined twins and both have to end up with acceptable answers for the board to give a tick. So finally, the board sees the bankable feasibility study and sees that it can potentially make some money. It sees the EIS and, and there's no showstoppers in the EIS and, 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 and the, the impacts that have been identified are all adequately controlled and addressed. Goes, the EIS goes to the, to the regulators and the regulators ultimately pass it, one hopes. The bankable feasibility study is used by the board to go off to the banks and get a loan. So finally, you've got your funding and the project go, go ahead, uh, is, 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 is the go button is pushed and the, the job goes out to Bechdel or Blinking uh, uh, Stearns Rogers or, or uh, uh, um, what's their name, um, yeah, K, K, KBR or, or, or one of these big uh, engineering consortiums and, and they go to work and they build the thing and hopefully what the company gets back from them is something that's more or less nameplate capacity and more, more or less uh, on cost and on budget and on time but maybe is not. That's the way things go. So project concept planning requires choosing between different uh, concepts. Uh, you've got to minimise your capex, opex, uh, you've got to get the desired production rate, you've got to minimise payback time and, and hence maximise expectation net present value. Basically said the same thing there. Notes from terrestrial mining, there's a vast range of ore body types and geometries and a vast range of mining methods. It can be open pit, shallow or deep, soft or hard rock, strip mine or dredge. It can be underground, large vertical extent, long hole open stoping, air leg or mechanised cut and fill block cave. There's a bunch of different approaches. It can be large horizontal extent with room and pillar, long wall mine, in situ leacher and stope leacher. You need to choose the right process. The choice of manning, mining plan and process is often surprisingly difficult. Uh, and I've been involved in uh, three of those four projects that I'm listing there. And, uh, when we were writing the Olympic Dam Copper Uranium Gold Project EIS, we didn't know. We, had, we presented in our EIS three different underground mining approaches and three different processing choices. We had to choose. It was not, not, not straightforward. The Mulga Rocks Uranium and Base Metals Project also is one that... Uh, that multiple choices about how you, how you mine the stuff and how you process the stuff. This is on the earth. Guess what? We're going to have exactly the same problem in space. Do we, for example, seek to get all of these different products out at once? Do we seek to get the nickel iron metal and the volatiles and the PGMs? Or do we go for just one of them? Metallica is a small exploration company that has found scandium, cobalt and nickel in a, in a, in a, a couple of ore bodies in the far north Queensland. And uh, as of about uh, 12 months ago, they thought they had a nickel cobalt mine with scandium um, icing on the cake. When they did their capex, they found it would cost them something like one and a half billion dollars to get up, and, and they said, we'll never be able to raise this money, we've got to reduce our capex. Their environmental manager said, well, why don't we go for scandium and stockpile our cobalt and nickel, and that'll get us our capital cost down to 250 million. Gets us started. Um, once we've got money going, we can build uh, phase two and start taking out our nickel and our cobalt. So there was a situation where they didn't even know what their primary product would be. Hello? We're going to be in the same situation. The scary thing for this particular mob is that scandium has a world annual usage of about 30 tonnes at the moment. right? Uh, and, and they're banking on the fact that... that uh, Something like 1% scandium in, in aluminium makes it as strong as titanium or stainless steel, and it's much sought after by the aerospace community. Boeing and Airbus would love to have a, a reliable source of scandium, and it's worth 
hundreds of dollars a pound. So here they are banking on a market that's not yet there, except for the promises and the, and the, and the, and the enthusiasm of these potential purchases. Does this remind us of something? It reminds us of exactly the same thing that we are facing in asteroid mining. So here's an under, it's a couple of underground pictures of Olympic Dam. I, I worked at the Olympic Dam for, oh God, 10 years, a bit more. Uh, that's an underground stope rig on the, on the right-hand side and, and an underground long hole open stope on the left-hand side. These holes are the size of skyscrapers. You stand near the edge and throw a rock over into this hole and it, it's 150 metres, 150, not 150 feet, 150 metres to the bottom. When they finish taking all the ore out of the, out of the hole, they... Uh, they brick up the, the tunnels that, that, that lead to the different drilling levels. They brick them up and, and they, they pour in from the surface, half a kilometre up, fill a hole, pour in concrete, 2% cement mixed concrete, to fill it up. The biggest usages of cement in the world are underground long hole open stopes. <laughs> Why have you got to fill it up? So you can mine the next bit. There's an aerial. Uh, this is a massive project. Uh, that airstrip's a one mile long airstrip down the bottom. Uh, the, um, the metallurgical plant is the, is the, is the long smudge uh, to the right of, of what are obviously evaporation ponds and tailing stamps and things. That, that, that uh, metallurgical plant is, is two kilometres long. I used to get my exercise by walking that. Five minutes, thank you very much. So, uh, you know, that, that's. We're not talking large scale, we're talking small scale. Beverly Uranium, in situ leach, all you see on the surface is, is, um, is, is boreholes and pipes. So what is our market? How much? Is it water, nickel, iron, regolith, PGMs to earth, the lot? Where are we going to be seeking to, 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 to deliver our products to? Well, where our market is. Uh, is it going to be in Leo, Geo, Earth Moon, L1 or L2, Moon? We don't know yet. What's our mining methods going to be? Are we going to be surface reclaim of our regolith? Or are we going to be underground bore, boring into the, into the bodies? Well, you know, remains to be seen. How are we going to beneficiate or process the material? Mechanical, electrostatic, vapour process. Mechanical miners got to solve anchoring. It's got to solve how you break up the material, common muted. It's got to be ground control. You've got to stop the ground from collapsing in on you. Even in microgravity, that's an annoyance. You've got to contain the product cuttings, then you've got to handle the cuttings, you've got to separate and store the products. So mining um, is going to include uh, a collection of the regolith, it's going to include possibly sub subsurface excavation, it might be simply removal of a boulder off the surface, it might be free in space capture. Conceptual process flow sheet, anchor, excavate regolith, contain, disaggregate, separate, collect and package. We've got to get the process right. These tasks are easy to visualise. They're not difficult. The thing which is different about them is that we're trying to, we're proposing to do them in zero gravity and in vacuum. But they are not difficult tasks. So uh, from terrestrial processing, we've got simple methods, gravity, magnetic, electrostatic separation. We've got complex methods, pyrometallurgic, hydrometallurgic, electrolytic vapor phase. We've got to choose between our processing methods. I'm going to miss the, sea, uh, the seabed massive sulphide story. I'm going to go... Ah. <laughs> Here we go again. It's the second last slide. Um, so our pathway to commercialisation is flyby missions, rendezvous and assay, sample return, bulk mass return. Um, what techniques will we pursue? It's too early to say. But we have to use these sort of mental processes that I talked about in sieving between them. Whatever we choose must be a robust, a robust mining method and a robust metallurgical processing, beneficiation and further processing. And that, ladies and gentlemen, uh, is my little story. We do have a few minutes for questions. If you can come to the mic. Hey, Mark. Nice talk. Yeah, I have a question. G'day, Al. Now, the Obama administration has asked Congress for $100 million to start this mission to bring a 500-ton 
body into cislinar space and send some astronauts and do some stuff and go home. And when they're done, if it's successful, and we can argue about whether it's a good idea, but let's just pretend they did it and pretend it's successful. When they're done, there's going to be 500 tons of, of, of asteroid in cislunar space, and the astronauts are going to bring a bunch of information back. What information do they need to bring back so that a, a proper ore body model can be created so that a private company can go and lease that asteroid uh, mineral rights and mine it and make some money? Uh, I, I, the very first stuff that you want to know is uh, basic uh, composition. Strength, strength both of the, of the material in bulk, the regolith, as it is, or if it's not regolith, it's a monolith, the strength of the monolith, and strength of the mineral grains. So or, c composition, and composition might be obtained by, uh, by chemical assay of samples, earlier than that by X-ray diffraction analysis using field XRF machinery. Um, so composition is number one. Bulk strength and grain strength is number two. Uh, and, and particle size and particle size distribution and porosity are the other things. Once we know things like uh, composition uh, and, and grain size and grain size distribution and porosity, we're a long way down the track towards understanding how we might handle and disaggregate if needed, and separate that stuff. That's it. And, and you know, it's, it's not blindingly difficult. We don't need neutron activation analysis or, or, or anything complex. It's basic, basic. The sort of stuff that, 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 that if we were living in the 1920s, you'd ask a mineral processing lab to report. Not difficult stuff. You're saying timeline, Vlad? Yeah. Uh, timeline from uh, mineralization discovery through proof of ore body through to uh, uh, project go ahead through to project uh, operational status. That's what you're on about. Yeah. If it's something very simple and straightforward like a gold mine in a gold prospective area, like the Nevada Carlin trend or, or like the Kalgoorlie gold, gold fields of, of, of Western Australia, uh, you can move through from initial mineralisation discovery to ore body, um, to, to, mineral, to, to economic mineralisation uh, um, um, confirmation through to uh, ore reserves in, in, a, in, in a year, in a year of intensive drilling. And then you can move from there through to um, uh, pr project startup in probably another year or so. Maybe, you know, the very shortest, very fastest development for, for a gold mine from initial discovery of the mineralisation through to proof of economic mineralisation, inferred or... or um, or, or higher classification resources, and then through to, to mining reserves, and then through to, to ore body, might be as short as two or three years. Three years, let us say. For something more controversial like uranium, it can take 10 years, because most of it is permitting, and, 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 and the, the, the vastly complex uh, social oversight. For something like, like oil, fields in a known oil fields area. Again, it might be as short as a year. But for totally greenfield activities, you know, um, whatever, the, whatever the product is, for greenfield, bringing a new greenfield, oil field or base metal mine or something like that f into, into, into reality, could be, could be 10 years. There have been, been some cases uh, where it's taken 40 years for mineralisation to end up being a mine. Uh, there's a large 
um, lead zinc mine in the Northern Territory of Australia called MacArthur River that was discovered something like 50 years ago. But they couldn't grind it. It was, it was too fine grained for grinding technology for 30 years. And it finally got up and running about 10 years ago. So it depends on, on, the, on, the, on the vagaries of the case. Something for, for people from outside the minerals industry to be aware of is the enormous variability between different situations. If, if you want to start a coal mine, on the other hand, a coal mine in the Sydney Basin, you get your bloody lease, you do some drill holes to confirm the thickness of the seam, you, you then, and so there's, there's, a, there's a time requirement for the legals, for the permitting, which might be six months or something like that. And then there's the timeline for access. It might be a, a shaft access, might be a decline access, and setting up your long wall miner and you're into it. It might be no longer than a year. Right? So it depends. It, it's, it, it's important to know this range of situations that we are facing. Uh, and what would you think about space? Like, what's, what's your idea of the timeline? Well, you know, its timeline in space is going to be driven by synodic periods, and, and if we need to have a precursor mission go out to a target and identify it, what's the synodic period? That's going to define how soon you can get back to the thing. And if the synodic period is five years, you can't get back to it until five years after the first mission. And if you're using a home and transfer to get back, you know, that might be another eight months, whatever, depending on, on, on a particular orbit. So... Um, you know, we, we have to face the fact that we might have significantly extended timelines that we have to, that we have to work with. But on the other hand, there, there, might, there might be some targets that are easy to get to. And if, if we've got a target that's, a, that's in, a, in an Earth-Sun Trojan or Earth-Sun Horseshoe or Tadpole orbit, that takes away the problem of synodic um, intermittency. So, in terms of ownership, is it going to be something predetermined, or is it going to be, sorry, in, in terms, terms of, of ownership of the ownership. asteroids, is it going to be something predetermined, or do you land by it? How is it going to be claimed, the asteroid? I'm sorry, I don't understand the question yet. Okay, so you're collecting material from the asteroid. Now, in terms of the ownership, is it going to be predetermined, or is it based on if you actually receive the area first? Well, you know, we're in a situation where the legal, uh, uh, the legal definition of ownership is not yet clear. Um, but if you look at the history of mining in remote parts of the world, it has always come back to um, uh, essentially the venturer that puts energy into defining and proving up a resource is given either direct ownership or is given a, a, a right to work the resource by whatever the, 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 the legal entity is that's controlling the area, the king or the, or the government, if there's any, if there's any. And, uh, for example, in, in, the, in the Australian situation, I looked recently at the Queensland Mining Act. And the Queensland Mining Act says something like, mineral resources in the ground are, are owned by the Crown. Uh, a miner working under appropriate legal approvals gains ownership of those mineral resources when he extracts them from the ground. I think the same will apply. Thank you. Guess that concludes this morning's session for the asteroid track. Be sure to come back this afternoon. There will be a lot.